Well, we, uh, uh, we, some people say we kind of look alike. If I wore, wear my glasses, yeah, that would have really, and have more hair. He's got, so I blame my kids <laughs> for losing my hair. But you have eight kids, and you didn't There's lose hope. Hair. There's hope. There's hope. I, maybe I'll blame it on Capstone. No, no, don't do that. Don't All right, do that. so uh, Mr. Ken Forrester, take it away. Thank you, friend. That's the nicest anyone has ever called me an old man. Did you catch that? That, that? that was just awesome. I am so glad to see you and grateful to the Lord for the opportunity to come and to share with you. And uh, I do love Walt and uh, Chris and the leaders here and just your heart and your passion. Um, I, I'm telling you, um, I really have been in this, this ministry thing for a long, long time. And um, I, I promise you this, 98% of the churches um, that claim to be gospel-centric really aren't. And I'm telling you, you are a part of a fellowship that is extremely gospel-centered. Uh, I love the fact that your report card is not nickels, noses, and numbers. Your report card is about life transformation. How is this city being transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I want to encourage you today, don't back up on that, okay? I mean, I love that. I love that heart. I love that vision. And uh, even what God is doing with Fike, and you heard Amanda and her passion for that. I'm telling you, that is good, good stuff. At the same time, I think the Lord wants me to share an encouraging word to you, and that is just, be careful. When God calls you to do something, God will equip, right? And then you've you got to stay close to Jesus. And so we're going to look at a story today about two sisters. And some of you know this story. You probably know this story better than I do. And, uh, but there's two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, how many of you have a sibling? Okay, very good. Does that sibling look like you? Any twins? Okay, okay, a couple, couple of twins. But uh, most of my kids, I mean, we do have eight, uh, Seth, Stephen, Sarah, Silas, Samuel, Stephen, Sean, and Susanna, okay? And uh, I can't do that again, so don't ask me, all right? And uh, so, so all these S's, uh, Seth is 32, he's the oldest. Our youngest is Susanna, she's 17, all right? And uh, so, uh, wow, even when I say that, yeah, our house was crazy, y'all. It was crazy. It was, it, was, it was nuts. So my kids look, they favor, but they're also very unique and they're very different. So I would imagine that's true for Mary and Martha. They may have favored complexion or whatever, but they were very different. Martha was the kind of person that liked to get her done, okay? Martha was a list maker. Any list makers in the house? Just be honest, all right? Good. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about, here's what I'm going to do, and man, you're a go-getter. It's action Jackson, right? Action, action, action. Get her done, mark her off. And uh, so my wife is that way. Okay, I'm, I'm married. I, I am married to Martha, all right? And, and she, she gets up in the morning, she's got her list. This is what we're going to do. Tick, 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 tick. By 6 p.m., she's done with the day, and she's already thinking about tomorrow, right? And so she, even when she tries to sit down, she can't sit down. She, she'll sit down on the couch for two seconds and she goes, oh, uh, that looks like fingerprints on the, on the television screen. So get to Windex and she's, you know, cleaning it up and then she'll sit back down and go, oh, oh, that's a little dusty over there. And she'll go, do this. oh, I forgot Susanna's got a, a dentist appointment tomorrow. I got to go get some milk. And I mean, it's just like she cannot shut it down. Okay, there's some of you who know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And then there's others are like Mary. And Mary, Mary was just kind of, Mary was just, um, you know the kind of person that kind of flies by the seat of their pants and nothing bothers them? Mary's never going to have an ulcer. I mean, she's not. I mean, she's just, it's just however the wind blows and just, you know, okay. And so, so here are these two different. Now, Jesus is going to, to um, uh, tell us something about these ladies, okay. He's in relationship with them. I mean, this is an amazing thing. I mean, these are truly friends of Jesus. So as he's traveling, he's doing ministry, you, you can see in the Scripture several times where there's interaction with this family, okay? Remember, they had a brother, right? His name was Old Laz. And so, uh, so, so here's Jesus. He's been out. He's got some disciples with him. And, uh, and so that's what 8, 9, and 10 is all about. It's all about core discipleship. What does it really look like, Okay. And so he's called men to follow him. So a disciple is one who follows Jesus. Number two, a disciple is one who, who uh, is continually changed by Jesus. 
I mean, God's always doing something. We call it sanctification, this this continual change where He's working in us through the power of His Word and in spiritual community that we, we just grow. We are being transformed more and more into His likeness. And then third, a, 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 a disciple is one who embraces the mission of Christ as their own. So they, they see how they fit into the kingdom. They, they, they see how they're uniquely been gifted and God uses that for His glory. And so that's what you have here in this story with these two sisters. The fact they're following Jesus, they are serving Jesus, and they're, they're, they're getting to know Jesus in a more deeper and intimate way. And all those things are important, but you can get out of balance. And so you're going to see that one of these sisters kind of gets things out of balance. And one keeps things in balance. And so what I want to do, I'm just going to tell you now, I, I've got to talk fast, which means you have to listen fast, all right? And Because uh, we got things to do today, right? Martha's right. we got things we got to do today, okay? So I will tell you what that Kardashian chick told her last husband. I won't keep you long, all right? So you, you just got to listen, all right? You, you just, <laughs> that's terrible. And uh, so, so you just got to listen. So listen to this story. Luke chapter 10. If you, if you got a copy of God's Word and you want to follow along, you can do that. And, uh, but, but listen to these words. Because here's the story. Now as they went on their way, so here's Jesus' disciples, or the, the, the men who are with Him. Some people believe it could have been the 12. Some, some scholars think it was as many as 30. There are several that I've read who believe it could have been as many as 100 people with Jesus. So what if, what if one of your friends called you and said, hey, i got a couple buddies, we're going to come over, and uh, could you, could, you, you got some food, you got some snacks you could help us out with? He said, yeah, what if 100 people showed up, okay? So, so start getting the, the context. So, so, so now as they were on their way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister's left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So there's two points in the whole message. Here they are. You're either distracted or you're devoted. And I want to unpackage those two thoughts, okay? So here's Martha. So, so Martha has invited Jesus into her house. She is going to exercise her gift of hospitality. You will note in the text that Jesus does not condemn her for using her spiritual gifts. It is a wonderful thing that she used her spiritual gift, and it was hospitality. It was open up her house, and, and she was going to cook for Jesus. And I don't know what his favorite meal was, but, but, but maybe it was, what if it were fried chicken? Okay, just, 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 just stay with me for a second, all right? What if it were fried chicken? So she's frying the chicken, and she's going to give Jesus the biggest piece, right? Because he's Jesus. And then and, and, and let's say she made a chocolate cake. I love chocolate cake. You like chocolate cake? Love chocolate cake. I'm getting hungry right now thinking about chocolate cake, all right? And so she, she cuts Jesus the biggest piece, and some of the disciples are looking at her going, you know, why, why does she always cut Jesus the biggest piece of cake? And Martha would say, because he's God, all right? Because he's God. And so I'm going to give him the biggest piece of cake. And so, so she is serving. She is doing some things that God equipped her to do. But did you catch that she was distracted because of much serving. You ever overextended yourself? You ever said yes when you should have said no? Okay? And so that's where Martha is at. And now she's distracted because of all the serving that she is doing. So, so, the, the, so Jesus is leading the small group, the life group, the home group. And so they're in there. And, and Martha says, okay, y'all just keep going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into the kitchen and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start cooking. I'm going to start fixing you know, something, something to eat. I say fixing, okay? I'm from the south. And I say fixing. I cut on stuff. I mash buttons. I don't have a water hose. I have a, I have a hose pipe, okay? That's just who I am, all right? And so, and so she goes in and she starts cooking. And, it, and it's okay at first because she's exercising her gift. The longer she's in there, it bothers her. The Bible says that she was distracted. Let me give you a progression of what it could look like being distracted. Number one, 
It's called isolation. The God of heaven was sitting in her den, but she took herself out of the den and she put herself into the kitchen. She separated herself. She isolated herself from the lifeline. And so she's in there, and she's going to cook. Now, she's going to exercise her gifts, so she starts to cook. But, but you know what? She is in there by herself. There are a lot of folks in that den, and she wants to serve them, and she wants to serve them well. And all of a sudden, she begins to look, and she kind of peeps out, and she kind of looks and sees what's going on, and, and she smiles at her sister, Mary. Now, if you are married, you understand this phrase, married English. There are, things that, there are ways that my wife can look at me and I know exactly what she's saying. And so when, Mary, when Martha was looking over, looking at Mary, she was really thinking, I need you to get in here. But she didn't budge. She sat right there at the feet of Jesus. And the more she was in that kitchen and the more she tried to serve in her own strength, the more frustrated she got. Listen, isolation can lead to frustration. It, 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 you could have some expectations on people that go unmet. And when you have an unmet expectation, it bothers us, doesn't it? When people don't think the way we think they should think, it bothers us. When people don't do what we think that they should do, it really bothers us. And when you are living in your flesh, here's the deal. You want everybody doing everything whose way? Your way. So that's what's going on. She has separated herself. She's isolated. Now she was coming, she's becoming frustrated. Frustration can lead to interruption. So think about it. Here's Jesus pouring himself into those people. And what does she do? She barges into the Bible study. She interrupts the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When you get distracted, I'm telling you, you can upset what's going on that Jesus has for you and even for somebody else. And so she, she just interrupts what God is doing. And then she makes an accusation. She says this, Lord, don't you care? She is living in her feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. I mean, she is living in her feelings. She's not living by faith. She's living in her feelings. And, and she's so upset at what, what her sister Mary is not doing. She's accusing her of not doing anything. Think about this. She even accused God of not caring. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me here alone? You know what she's having? She's having a good old-fashioned pity party. You ever had a pity party? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll eat some worms. I mean, you know, that's, that's how we can live life sometimes. And we're just down and, and, you know, poor old pitiful who? Me. And in that moment, she says, Jesus, you are not doing things right. Can you imagine that? Think about it. Isolation, frustration, interruption, accusation, and now she's dominating. She's telling God what to do. I'm going to tell you, that's a bad day. That is not going to be a good day when you start telling God what to do, all right? When we assume that we are in control and we know what God needs to do and we're upset because God's not doing what we think God should do. You ever been there? Sure we have. My, my, uh, my, my grandmother, I, I had a grandmother, uh, her name was Dot, okay? Dot, Dorothy. And she was married to Ernest. Now, Ernest was about six foot seven and about that big around. And my grandma Dot was... I don't know really how much she weighed, but she was as round as she was tall. I promise you that, all right? Mean as a snake, could outcuss a sailor, all right? I, I was sitting on her front porch one day, and she was quoting to me the book of Ruth. It's a true story, Chris. She's telling me her favorite, her favorite, this lady cussed and cussed and cussed. But one day she said, let me tell you about my favorite book in the Bible. And she starts telling me the book of Ruth, and I was like, wow. I mean, I, I'm like 10, 11 years old, and I'm like, Wow, and she's, I mean, it, it's, it's, she is just pouring her heart out about Ruth, and a car pulls in this little circular driveway, and a guy gets out, and she says, I, I think you better get your blankety-blank self in that blankety-blank car, and I was like, whoa, and she said, if you don't get your blankety-blank self in that blankety-blank car, I'm going to take this blankety-blank pistol, I'm going to shoot your blankety-blank head off, I don't know where it came from, I don't know where it came from, now, 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 you got to remember, we, Welford, okay, Welford, live right on the railroad tracks, the couch was on the front porch. Not kidding. True story. Somewhere out of her house coat, because she always wore a house coat all the time, she had a revolver in her hand. 
I'm the true story. And she had that thing pointed at man. Man, he got back in the car, he peeled out, and she went right back telling me the story of Ruth, all right? She was just mean as a snake. And she was one of those kind of folks that she loved discipline. Because <laughs> she does not like being in control, you know. And she had a wooden spoon. And if you got out of, you got out of hand at all, pop, oh, you've got a wooden spoon is what you got. Now, this is probably terrible theology. I hope this is, I, I, I know this is not so, this is more exegesis than exegesis. And that can be a, a dangerous road to get on. But in my mind, that's what I see. I see Martha kind of, kind of running in, interrupting Jesus. And she's got a wooden spoon <laughs> popping Jesus with a wooden spoon trying to tell him what to do. Can I tell you something? I'm not God and you're not God. Amen. There's only one God. And just to help you with that, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you out with something. Everybody raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, I being of sound mind, have, have never, or nor will I ever be, the master of the universe. Therefore today, I resign as the master of the universe. Now don't you feel better, all right? And so, so here... here all this happened, why? Because she's not sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's not that her service was wrong. Listen close. But when you begin to serve in the absence of worship first, you will always be frustrated. That's why some people start out, man, they're just, they're just so gung-ho for Jesus and, and you give them six months. You know what I'm talking about, right? Give them six months and you can't even find them. What happened? Could it be they tried to serve out of self-reliance? Could it be that they tried to serve out of a, a self-will instead of worshiping Jesus for who He is? And out of that worship is birthed this beautiful service. And even as you engage in service... You see it as worship unto Jesus. Distracted. It's not that Martha loved Jesus less. I don't think at that moment Martha knew how to love Jesus best. And here's what he says. So she's come through. She makes this accusation. And you know what? He's, he's God. He could have done anything he wanted to, right? He's God. And what does he do? He says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about so much. But Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. What was he saying? He was saying, Martha, it's not wrong to serve. But you're more concerned about the condition of your house. Mary's more concerned about the condition of her heart. You're willing to set everything aside so that the house is spotless and the food is the best. But Mary hath chosen the good part. Why? Because she has set everything aside for me. So that I can pour myself into hers again. Why is that so significant in that chapter? Because if you back up a few chapters, you will see this thing called the transfiguration. Here is a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. And, and when he's being transfigured, God the Father says, this is my son. This is him. And what does he say? Listen to him. One translation says it this way. Listen to what he says. What is Mary doing? She is being devoted. She has this posture of sitting at his feet. She is in an attitude of worship. She wants to hear what God has to say. And she knows that what he is going to say will help shape what she does. And then you fast forward. What does she do? She goes one day and she gets this alabaster box. She has this very expensive perfume. And what does she do? Selflessly, she pours it out on Jesus. Remember that? And then she washes it with her own hair, his feet. And so this service isn't wrong. Service is right. When I was growing up, preachers would say, everybody, you know, don't be a Martha, only be a Mary. That is not what Jesus is saying in this text. He is, he, 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 he's saying this. There's a priority. So if I were to ask you a question today, 
you know, are you, are you really sitting at the feet of Jesus? Are you really hearing what he has to say? Have you, have you brought, you, I mean, you just want to know him. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, there's three dominant things that are going, three cords that are all woven together. Follow him, serve him, know him. Follow him, serve him, know him. All those things are in play. And here's what Jesus says, there's a priority to those things. And the priority is I want you sitting at my feet. And I want to communicate with you. I want to speak to you. I want to commune with you. I want you to know my heart. You know, if I, could, if I took some scripture and used it to, to explain scripture, I'd take you to John 15. So in John 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, you know, I am the true vine, which means every other vine is a counterfeit. I am the true vine. A vine means this. A vine means it gives everything the branch needs in order to produce fruit. I've got some grapevines where I live. I've got some grapevines. It's the coolest thing. The first year we lived there, I didn't pay me any attention. I, just, I mean, I just, I just thought they would do their thing. And they don't, they don't just do their thing. So I've learned to prune, I've learned to cut, I've learned to, to work with those things. And I'm telling you, I'm going to have the greatest harvest of grapes in, in, the, in the three years that we've been there. It's the craziest thing in all the world. But here's what I learned about that grapevine. That grapevine has everything in it that is sufficient for the branch to bear fruit. You know that's what Jesus is trying to communicate to Martha. Martha, it's not wrong that you serve. But if you're trying to serve without me, you're trying to serve in your own strength, I want you to understand, I am sufficient for all that you need. And Mary understands that. Both are important. Both are right. Both are necessary. He just said this, Martha, you're so distracted because you got a bad attitude. I want you to sit at my feet. And when you, know, when, when you sit at my feet and I pour myself into you, then guess what? What you do will not exhaust you. It won't irritate you. As a matter of fact, you'll delight in it. And that is the part that Mary has chosen. You know, there's a lot of things in life that frustrate me. My kids frustrate me sometimes. There, there are days that um, I understand why some animals eat their young. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I, I can get it. And sometimes I want them to do certain things because that's the way I want it done. You with me? I mean, I have pet peeves. Everybody in this room has got pet peeves. I have a, I'll, I'll give you an example. Here's, here's my biggest pet peeve at my house, okay? This is when I feel like I am so much a Martha. My kids, i got, you know, six boys, so they're all, even the ones that are married and out of the house, when they come back, everybody loves drinking chocolate milk. My boys love chocolate milk. And so here's what they'll do. They'll go in there, they'll start talking, they're cut up, they're laughing, they're drinking chocolate milk, and then they set their dirty glass on the counter three inches below where that glass is sitting. It's called a dishwasher. And in, there's a pet peeve. Why don't they just open up the dishwasher and, you know, and I would rinse it out first, right? Even when they put it in there, they don't rinse it out. It's milk. Do you know what milk does a couple of days after it sits in the dishwasher? It stinks, right? <laughs> that is a pet peeve I have. And I, you know, it just drops my goat. Why? Because they're not doing what I think they should do. You understand that's where Martha was, right? Why was she there? Because her worship was backwards. She tried to work without worship. And Jesus has said, no. It's worship first. I want you to know my heart. It's hard to believe, but in August, I'm going to be married to Pat 36 years. We'll celebrate our 36th wedding anniversary. On, on August of 27, 1983, I entered the institution of marriage. But I didn't get an institution that day. Guess what? I got a wife. <laughs> Her name was Pat, five foot nine and simply divine. 
she is awesome. I'm telling you, to this day, I still get the warm fuzzies, okay? My boys hate it, but get over it, all right? Just get over it. I love her. Oh, my soul. You know what? So when, 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 when Jesus changed my life, I, listen, I didn't get this thing. I didn't get an institution called salvation. I got a real person, and his name was Jesus. And Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, says, I want time with you. I don't have to tell you, we, we don't live in a merry world. We live in a Martha world. And some of you men and women, you thank God for Memorial Day. Why? Because at least you got a day off. We work and work and work and work and work. We can't say no because we're afraid to say no. If I say no to my boss, I may not have a job. I mean, that is the culture that we live in. And so you work, your, you just, you work yourself to death. Even in the church, we know nothing of Sabbath and rest. Jesus says, Martha, you're so worked up. You're exhausted. You, you think the most important thing is fixing something for me to eat? Why are you panicking over that? Did you not know what I did two chapters earlier? There are 5,000 men, their wives and kids came up one day. A little boy had a Lunchable. I took his Lunchable, and guess what? I fed thousands of people. Hey, hey, hey. Life is more than just food. Man cannot live by bread alone. Martha, it's not that you need to feed me. What's important is I need to feed you. And if you will sit at my feet, you will continue to serve. Yes, I created you to serve. But Martha, listen, I'm going to put all the cookies on the bottom shelf. Martha, you just got your priorities out of order. You're trying to do I want you to be. R.C. Sproul, guy that I, I read from time to time because he's so much smarter than I am. He died a few months ago, went home to be with the Lord. And, but he talked about his, his childhood sweetheart. He met her like when they were in the third grade in the own playground. They met each other, became sweethearts. I think it was like second or third grade. And, and they married, and they, I forgot how many years they were married. A long, long time. And he said he, he was watching some bees. And he noticed that that was the difference between him and her. Some of the, the, the worker bees, they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then, and then the, the other bees were just staying right there, you know, at the hive. And, and he said, those are the bee bees. They just like being. They know their role. They're, they are bee bees. And he said, I'm more like a do bee. <laughs> I know I'm in Fountain Inn. Y'all, okay, I'm not talking about that, all right? <laughs> so... <laughs> so so today, if I, were to, if, I, if I were to give you like a name tag, you, you, know, you, you know, if you go somewhere and they give you a, you know, a, a Sharpie and you have to write your name, and, okay? If I were to pass out name tags today, which name would you have? If, and I say, look, your name could only be Martha or Mary. Which one of those two ladies, honest to God, now on, be honest with me, which one of those two ladies do you most identify with today? Martha, Mary. Doesn't mean one's better than the other. That's not what Jesus said. But it's the priority. And just in case you don't know what you would be, if you don't know who you are, you are Mary. Because Martha's no, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Martha's no. So could it, could it be that Jesus today is saying, hey, come here. You're wore out. You're exhausted. I love you for wanting to serve, but you're trying to do this in your own strength. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to come and just sit at my feet. And I'm going to pour my word into you. It will be your strength, and it will be your nourishment, I will guide you, I will strengthen you, I will equip you through the power of my word. And then as you serve, you will realize why you do what you do.
Lord, today. I can feel the tension of God wanting to to do something, to be a part of something. And and I know what it's like to, to kind of step out, even in ministry that maybe you haven't, uh, prepared me for and I'm trying to do things God in my own strength and God I know what it is to be frustrated I know what it is to just be so sick and tired of being sick and tired I know what it is to be critical I know what it is to look at other ministries or a, a pastor and uh, people God and wish they would do what I do or think what I think and God those are those moments that you have used in my life to show me my rotten, stinking self. And thank you that you lovingly and patiently call me to sit at your feet. God, to know your heart, to know your intentions, to be fed by you, equipped by you, to be sustained by you, And then, God, to go out in that ministry and really experience joy. God, God, it doesn't, real ministry is hard and it's ugly at times, it's dirty. But, God, when I'm doing it for the right reason and I'm doing it from worship, even when things don't go my way, there's still joy. So, Lord, would you just call people to yourself today? God, I pray that folks would just learn to rest in you. God, to sit at your feet and let you pour yourself into them. God, would you bring them Sabbath? Would you bring them rest? Would you bring them spiritual nourishment? But God, prepare and equip for what you have for them that would bring you great glory and that your kingdom would be advanced. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.